Welcome to The Comment Writers. I'm your host, Josh Meek, the Uber Geek, joined, as always, by my friend Toby Tobes. What's up, Toby? Pretty good, Josh, but I have an important question for you. I'm ready. Hit me. What do you think is sold in the in the tortured poets department? Okay, or, you're going to have to... Or what work is done there? You're going to have to explain this to me because I saw... A reference to like three random guys are in the tortured poet society because they have a group chat or something. What what does all this mean? I have no idea. So the three guys is just a joke with the Swifties memeing on some Taylor ex boyfriends. Oh, okay. So that's that's what they have in common is they all dated Taylor Swift. Yeah. So as Taylor Swift, my favorite DIY artist, uh, <laughs> won her, won her fourth Grammy. I think the other night, Sunday night. Is it only fourth? I thought she had many more than that. I might be wrong. I feel like I it's four. <laughs> four, yeah. four is probably right. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so for the past couple of days before now, she's been blacking out social media. She wore a pure black and white dress and black and white accessories and shit to the Grammys. So everyone thought that a different Taylor's album or Taylor's version album was dropping. But she won her Grammy and said that the Tortured Poets Department is coming out on April 19th. Oh, so it's a new album. It's a brand new album. Okay. Well, that's exciting for people who like Taylor Swift albums, I guess. Oh, wait. I think it was her fourth um, best album, or the hell the album thing is called. <laughs> okay. This is, her, <laughs> this is her 13th Grammy, which is Taylor Swift's <laughs> favorite number as well as mine. So she said oh. this is perfect for the timings in this. Okay. And she, so she walked in, this is a baller move. She walked into the Grammys so ready um, to, To to, so knowing she was going to win that she planned an announcement for it. Like, so some, yes. So some might say it's rigged. Like (laughs) she might have known before she got there. Some might indeed. (laughs) Uh, That's incredible. I guess. Yeah. I mean, like, those things have to be a little rigged, right? Because you got to make sure people show up. Like I could see, I could see if they weren't rigged, uh, getting to the point where people just like, well, I'm nominated, but I'm I, I didn't win, so I'm not gonna go. You know? Yeah, right? like I, you, you obviously want the winners to get there. Like no matter yeah. what, you want the winners to get there. Yeah. But the important huh. part is, so I was watching TV shows during the Grammys because I don't want to watch the Grammys, and then I looked online and like, oh, Taylor Swift album, the tortured poets department now on sale so i looked at it and i was like is this some super old album that i was not thinking of so i had to google it real quick and i was 35 minutes late for the vinyl album drop josh the information got to me that got dis- uh, disseminated to me too slowly oh, no. so i actually had to sit in a 40 minute queue on taylor swift's website to pre-order the album and i sat there and stared at my phone for 40 minutes just watching the little splash screen go by and the time going down minute by minute did you did you get it though? I did get it. It'll okay. be here in April. I'm very excited. <laughs> uh, I was looking up when the last time Taylor put an album out, but it was it was just like 2022. Like it wasn't that long ago. Yeah. So apparently uh, she's been working on this one for two years. So I guess must have started guess, right after Midnight's. Then I guess. Yeah, and Midnight's I think is one of my favorite Taylor Swift albums because when it came out, I was all hyped and told you about it. This yeah, is like you- my this is my secret, not secret. <laughs> infatuation with not the band secret or at all <laughs> yeah but uh, i told josh when it came out i was like it's almost like a spoken world spoken word like emo album and so i was super into this so i'm actually <laughs> interested to see what this next bullshit is taylor puts out too many records because like okay she's putting out this one in april of 2024 she put out midnight's uh october 2022 that's a reasonable amount of time between between albums like, and she were and she world toured where she played the exactly. crazy heiress thing in between. Yeah, if we include like how much she's been up to in the in, in between, that's a ridiculously tight turnaround time in my opinion for an album. But the the two albums before this, Folklore and Evermore, she put them out in the same year, July well, of 2020 and December of 2020. They're like companion pieces or something. Are they? Is that that the deal here? I don't know. The names sound the same. They're both really like not real Toby music vibes i just i just can't even i really i i really respect taylor swift because you know i think that the re-recording her music and uh so that she can own it 
and 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 reselling it and getting all of those like back to the top of the charts and all the crazy stuff that she's done with that is like one of the most punk things that's happened in music <laughs> in probably the past like two decades. Like it's it's very cool. Um I just I just don't love any of her music though. <laughs> like I've tried and it's just not for me. That's um, I, I think that's what started when I started bugging you all the time about like I think I respect Taylor Swift a whole much whole bunch more now. Was I think when she announced it was either the first or second Taylor's version album. I told you about it. I was like, Josh, she's putting all of her, all of her old albums out just so she can get like her own like writing credits and stuff back. And we were both like, this is a DIY punk as fuck. Like, this is it awesome. Is. <laughs> like, it straight up is. Yeah. Like, like I made a bad deal early on and like, well, screw it. I have the I have the um, uh, star power to fix that now. And I'm, yeah, I'm just going to go back and re-record these. That's that's awesome. It It doesn't come across in the same way of like, like, I hate when, you know, uh directors go back and like redo the tweak their movies so they can like fix the cg or like so you can make it so you know uh han didn't shoot first or whatever right like star wars has done a million times uh but with with her doing it it feels way more punk for some reason maybe that's all (laughs) marketing and maybe she's done a very good job of marketing the taylor stuff but like yeah i really 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 respect all that i just um don't don't love her music as some of the other <laughs> pop stars that are out there. And I like pop music too, right? Like I'm, I'm a, I'm a Carly Rae Jepsen fan, but um, just not as much the Taylor stuff. Uh, but let, all right, let's, let's pivot our Taylor conversation slightly because you can't talk <laughs> about Taylor Swift in, in 2024 uh, without talking about her, her new boyfriend, <laughs> Travis Kelsey. <laughs> um, the people who are getting upset that, a football player has a girlfriend and that a pop star has a boyfriend are just in absolutely insane people. Like all the like football people who are like, Oh, I'm so sick of TC and Taylor Swift on my TV on Sundays. Like you people need to get a life outside of this sport. <laughs> like it is, that's an insane opinion to have. Like the camera cuts to Taylor Swift for like a second. Like Taylor Swift is bringing, it's like when bad bunny showed up in wrestling and all the wrestling people were like, who is this bad bunny guy? I was like, well, he's like the most recorded, mo- most popular recording artist in the world. Like, you should be happy that he's in wrestling because putting more eyes on wrestling. Like, in Taylor the- Swift is bringing in, bringing in eyes to football that hasn't, hasn't had <laughs> any football viewing. Since uh, she's arrived on the scene, the NFL, like the corporation, company, league, whatever you want to call it, has made like an extra $350 million. Yeah. From just her showing up on camera once a week, a second at a time at random things. But the funniest thing was when she first started dating him and everyone was like, oh, there's just going to be another song, blah, blah, blah. Both sides, like you said, it was the most insane, dumb shit because my football friends were like, this is dumb. They keep showing her. And my one friend was like, but she's going to bring a whole bunch of new fans to football. And I said, that's remotely true. But like the demographic she brought was 16 to 25 uh, female whatever the uh, the youngest yeah. track demo is. And I told him, I was like, the only downfall of this is, if this is a fake setup, whatever thing, as soon as Taylor Swift's gone, I would... Oh, they're I'm gone not gonna, too. I'm not yeah. going to say no one's going to watch it that was watching it now. That's rude. But I think most of them are probably going to bail. Sure. And on, the, and on the opposite side of that, when they started dating, all of the Taylor Swift fans online were like, Look at this meathead jock. He threw a punch at somebody during practice. He's going to beat the shit out of Taylor Swift when he gets mad. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was also super toxic <laughs> on the, the flip side. But yeah, <laughs> that that in general, the the Swifties who go and like um, essentially harass any dude she dates and like dig up all of his weird past stuff and everything. Those people are also insane. Yeah, everyone involved here is just it's just a bad look. Top to bottom. Both sides. Yeah, people are nuts. <laughs> and speaking of nuts, people. It's time for email. Yay! <laughs> yes, indeed. It is time for email this week. Toby, before we got jo- an email. Wait, wait, real quick. Before Josh reads the email, uh-huh. I want everyone to know that before we started recording, I told Josh I wasn't going to swerve him in the beginning of the episode like I always do, and I did it anyway. <laughs> I-, I was happy to be swerved. I had things to say <laughs> about Taylor Swift, apparently. Uh, that's really our dark secret, is you swerve me, and I'm always very happy to be swerved. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Toby, uh, if you want to send an email into the comment writers, also, I should probably mention we're a common writer podcast. Ostensibly. We talk about Taylor Swift for apparently 10 minutes 
Uh, but we do talk about Common Rider here as well, which is what these emails are about today. And if you would like to send an email into the show, send that over to cast at commonridersucks.com. If you have thoughts about Taylor Swift, please send, send them along. Um, cast at commonridersucks.com is the email address. Our first email comes in from David. Taylor Swift. Oh, okay. Not Taylor Swift. Comes in from David. So you might remember about six months ago, we received. I do. I, when I asked him to send me an email from where you, yes. how you found us. <laughs> exactly. Um, so for those of you the listeners out there who might not remember, David sent us in, in an email a while back. Um, and he was telling us about uh, the costumes. If you remember early on in Gotchard, um, we were really confused about uh, the like, what was it? The like crab costume like all, all the various costumes and stuff that um uh the one um what one 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 alchemist girl was wearing oh like the, the hats the hats like the octopus hat and the crab. yeah the hat, octopus whatever. hat thank you the octopus not not crab yeah um so david comes in again with an email with some really um awesome information so it's a little long but i want to read it all because it is um it's very cool stuff so david says hello again comment writers and then as you mentioned toby uh, first up, I'm sure Toby forgot that he asked me to say this. When no, I'm see, like, no, in. wait. So, <laughs> he's listened long enough. So that's bullshit. I remembered instantly. I remember you my did. question as soon as the name came up. Very impressed. Uh, since it was like five months ago, but he asked me to clarify how newish of a listener I was back then. I found out and started uh, binge listening to you guys right around the middle of the Jamato Grand Prix arc and managed to become a weekly listener at the end of the Jama God arc. So when I wrote in last time, I would have been a listener for about six months or so. Please let me know if you have any other requests. Toby. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I think right. I'm good now. But that's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for. Uh, wow. Thank- that's awesome that you like binge listening, caught up to current. And thank you for continuing to stick around. That's very exciting. Uh, David says, anyway, I wanted to touch on two topics today. Hodoro's mom and yo-yos. And a little bit of behind the scenes info that I think adds to the Majade debut and Kudo's story going forward. In the event that uh, Shade has already sent in trivia about either of these things, please feel free to skip. Uh, well, luckily for you, Shade's email is next, so you got first dibs here. Woo, you did it. <laughs> wah, 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 wah. <laughs> also, David, thank you so much. He has included some helpful pronunciation guides for me. <laughs> for some of the names which i all right david you can never write in again because everyone likes when josh struggles when we make fun of him so i'm gonna have to do the opposite of last time and say please hold off (laughs) no no david please write in it's a wonderful um this is a gold standard for emails everyone else should try to keep up (laughs) uh so hodoro's mom and yo-yos so obviously we had the episode uh where hodoro's mom is heading off to a club and it has something to do with yo-yos we laughed about that we thought it was a funny joke but there's actually a reason for that. So the actress who plays uh, Hodoro's mom is Yoko Minamino, who, uh, besides being a pop idol in the 80s, which is awesome. Hell yeah. Uh, Good job, is, Hodoro's mom. Is known for her role in the series Sukaban Deka, which translates to delinquent schoolgirl detective. <laughs> Sukuban Deka's general premise is that a delinquent schoolgirl is blackmailed slash deputized by the Japanese police force to act as an undercover agent in schools and stop crime. Her weapon of choice, steel yo-yos. <laughs> what Ryder <laughs> did for flying kicks, Sukuban Deka did for yo-yos. Basically, anytime you see a character, especially a schoolgirl, wielding yo-yos, odds are it's a Sukuban Deka reference. That's amazing. That's fucking hilarious. so good. Yeah. Originally a manga, the franchise exploded in popularity from the late eighties to early nineties, resulting in anime OVAs, video games, three live action TV seasons, all produced by Toei. The live action series loosely adapted the manga before diverting into original material. Each season stars a new pop idol whose character takes on the mantle of Sukuban Deka. Yoko Minamino was the star of the second season, Sukuban Deka 2, The Legend of the Girl in the Iron Mask, and it ran for 42 episodes. From what I can tell, this was, give, this was the most popular entry of the three. Given that it was a Toei produced show, I expect more tongue in cheek references and, if we're lucky, a cool action scene. After doing some research, I found that this is at least the second time that Gotchard has actually referenced her role. Uh, so, back in episode five, which is the Wrestler G episode, you can see in the foreground of one of the shots in the restaurant, 
there is actually a yo-yo kind of like on the counter between between the restaurant and the the kitchen area and there's also a like a mask that you can see on the table which is the legend of the girl in the iron mask uh, so yeah they, they they've called back to it before uh, d- and d- David actually uh, included a link here to the trailer for the Sukaban Deka movie, uh, which was a direct sequel to the second season. Uh, given how crazy the trailer looks, I really do hope that we do get some form of team up between Hodoro and his mom. Uh, and then, then David says, possible watch and react for the Patreon. The movie is definitely available in all the places that you would find Ryder. Um, if and they it, let it, his mom turn in the common Ryder yo-yo, <laughs> that, that might be the greatest moment in any show that we've watched together over the past 10 years that would be it'd be truly incredible especially yeah now that we know what what if that was like a end of the series like last two episodes Hodor's Hodor, just- <laughs> Hodor is dying and his mom hawks out and pulls the yo-yo out of her purse she's like it's on and she just starts swinging <laughs> that'd be great and the, the trailer does look really hilarious it is it is full-on like 80s like japanese nostalgia like you would expect there's like a group of five girls in the movie that are all like teaming up to fight their crime uh it it looks it looks hilarious <laughs> and, and very fun uh so that's awesome and then the other piece of information that david wrote in about is about the writer for jade's debut so again this this is kind of the the longer piece but is super super interesting and gives us some um kind of behind the scenes about common writer that you and i don't know too much about so um david says before i start i know it's already been covered how toei officially promoted um like majade as a secondary writer and how that's kind of a big deal but i really want to emphasize how cool that is i'm 33 and i've been watching writer week to week since i was 16 since deno so i've gotten to watch in real time the evolution of how how toei treats its female writers i have also gone back and watched all the pre-deno shows so i can say this pretty confidently toei really did female writers dirty for a long time it's only been since the start of Rewa, so five years or so, that female writers have been able to, one, regularly appear in the shows, two, make meaningful contributions to the plot, and most importantly, three, not die. <laughs> <laughs> With some exceptions, it was almost a surefire bet that if a female writer showed up in a Heisei show or movie, she would be dead by the end of it. To be at the stage where female writers both matter to the show and are also starting to get promoted at the same level as the guys while probably not a big deal for new fans, feels truly monumental to me as a longtime watcher. That out of the way, let's talk a bit about the writer behind Majade's debut. Akiko Inoue, choosing Miss Inoue, was a super cool and deliberate choice on Toei's part, and one that I think highlights what seems to be their new stance on female writers. She's been writing for Toei on the anime side since around 2018. And even though this is only the second writer-related thing she's worked on, the first being a spin-off novel for Colin Rider Decade, she was actually part of writer's long history well before Gotchard. Her father is the infamous Toshiki Inoue. Mr. Inoue began writing on anime for Toei in the 80s. He cut his teeth on toku shows by writing episodes for various Sentai from the same era. And then in 1991, he became the head writer for Chojin Sentai Jetman, uh, which is considered to be one of the all-time greatest Sentai shows. He was also responsible for writing the most memorable arc of Gosei Sentai Die Ranger, another very highly regarded Sentai. When Toei brought Ryder back in 2000, Inoue was brought on board and became Toei's golden child and one of the most creative forces behind the franchise at the time. He wrote 213 of the 474 episodes of early Heisei Rock Kamen Rider from 2000 to 2009. So that's Kuga to Decade. Writing for every show except for Common Rider Deno in 2007, the, the show that has ironically gone on to be the most popular from the era. He was head writer for Agito in 01. He wrote all but one of those episodes. Uh, Fies in 2003, writing all 50 episodes. Kiva in 08, writing uh, all but two of those 48 episodes. And in 05, he was brought in as replacement head writer for Habiki. Uh, and for episodes 30 to 48, he wrote 17 of those 19 episodes. And he's written six of the nine early Heisei summer movies and numerous specials. After Decade, Ryder began aping the success and style of Deno, so he became less involved on the weekly shows, instead occasionally writing TTFC specials or movies, including the Fi's 20th anniversary movie that premiered last month. Uh, and then uh, he says, Josh, since your, your favorite writer is Geo, he actually did briefly come back to TV uh, Ryder during this run, 
He wrote the two Kiva focused episodes, the one where Sogo thinks his long lost first love is the lady who broke out of prison and who kills people with manhole covers, all while Earth is invaded by the alien Kamen Rider Ginga, who only exists to be defeated to give Waz a power up toy and then is never seen again. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's Geo for you. <laughs> Inoue is is known for his love of absurd melodrama and miscommunication, his disdain for needing to write toys into his stories, and for his questionable slash unclear endings. In my opinion, he's someone who, when kept in check by a good director slash producer, has made some of the best common writer material out there, and when left to his own devices, has made some of the worst. Also, a lot of the female writer deaths I mentioned, mostly him. <laughs> Uh, the biggest theme he seems to be concerned with in Ryder is the relationship between a child and their parents' legacy, usually between a father and a son. It's fitting the man has daddy issues because his family's relationship with Ryder doesn't end with Mr. Inoue. His father, uh, <laughs> Masaki... Mr. Mr. In Inoue. <laughs> yep, exactly. Uh, better known under his pen name, uh, Masaru I Igame, did uh, for Showa Ryder what Inoue did for early Heisei. Showa writer shows didn't really have head writers in the same way that Heisei Reiwa ones do, but Igami um, is basically the closest thing to that. He wrote for every Showa writer from 71 to 81, uh, writing 129 of the 350 episodes. And in that number, he wrote 41 of the original Common Rider's 98 episodes and uh, more credited episodes on that show than any other writer, including the first three episodes, which have established some of the most iconic writer imagery. He wrote the original four Common Rider movies and uh, was almost always either the writer of the first episode or the finale episodes for the shows he worked on. In fact, he wrote the finale of Common Rider Stronger, which was kind of the original send off to writers first run on TV until the Skyrider slash Super One reboot. It's probably my favorite show era ending because it's one of the only times in writer history where they had all the original actors from all the prior shows reprise their roles in and out of the suit. Also, they fight a giant rock monster. To bring this back around to Miss in a way, I really hope Toei keeps her as the dedicated writer for all of Kudo's focused episodes going forward. Not only is it cool to have a female writer for our secondary female writer, but given that Kudo's whole deal is coming to terms with her dad's legacy, I legitimately cannot think of a better person to handle that aspect of her character. I really hope to see more of her going forward and what she can bring to the table. That's it for me this time, Dave. So that is super cool. So again, a lot of history there, but a a a woman writing Kudo's kind of big uh, henshin debut, and not only that, a woman who has both a father and a grandfather who have written for uh, for Common Writer is pretty wild. Yeah, that's a um, hell of a lot of legacy. Yeah, like, <laughs> whatever you want to call that. Uh, and yeah, I had no idea about any of that stuff. That that was. Um, that was even a thing <laughs> that, that that there was like legacy writers uh, and common writer and super cool again, as, as Dave mentioned here that Kudo is so focused on her dad and her dad's legacy and all that stuff that, that really gets to be sort of like real world inspiration. Very cool. So awesome, Dave. Uh, thank you very much for all of that information. Uh, super cool. As always, hopefully you don't wait as long before you write in again next time. <laughs> because uh, I enjoy receiving your emails. And we got one more email this week coming in from Shade. Um, so I'm going to leave out a little bit of Shade's email because he did talk about the yo-yos as well. So um, <laughs> since, since Dave got Dave in, in earlier. Yep. Uh, but Shade says, Valve of Fraud is no more. Great episodes all around. Something I didn't expect when Mad Wheel was Mad Wheel evolving like a Pokemon and just somehow switched his match. <laughs> now to some trivia. <clears throat> yeah, the, the, um, the Mad Wheel evolving kind of came out of left field but it was <laughs> it was a very fun and made sense kind of with what was happening with valverad for sure uh shade says first off um since i keep seeing them on twitter i'll keep sharing them another common rider reference in the yakuza game this one is just straight up a rider kick but with dolphins <laughs> <laughs> um so i love that common rider continues to do silly little references to common rider um so yeah, it's a guy riding on dolphins, jumps up in the air, and then does does a rider kick. It's good stuff. <laughs> um, and I like that. I like that we can get that. 
Uh, let's see. And then Shane says, now for something a little funny, if you look up some info about Spanner's parents, you'll notice that his dad's name is Wrenchy, which clearly derives from the word <laughs> wrench. Spanner's dad oh, dear God. is named Wrench. <laughs> Spanner's mother's name is a little confusing to me. Her name is Suzu, which is derived from the Japanese word for tin, T-I-N. Uh, I must not be a tool guy because I'm not really getting the reference here. Yeah, I mean, I guess like tin is a, a thing you can cut. Tin snips are a tool. I don't know. Tools are, I don't know. You, you, would, you would tin a, uh, um, a soldering iron. <laughs> I don't know. Well, like aluminum's. A mix yeah, of like, other stuff, right? Yeah, there's, there's so that'd that. Be like, that'd yeah. be like the, the whole alchemy crap to make some aluminum. I, I think that seems fair, yeah. Um, yeah, it's probably, probably all those things. But yes, um, Wrench being the dad's name is incredible. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, Shades writes in to tell us about the music releases that have happened recently for Gotchard. So the full version of uh, Kemi Story is out now which toby you linked in our discord as well many times it's so good <laughs> and along with that we got the official uh chinese and english versions of the song as well so the full version of the japanese song is awesome i think we could both agree on that um and then the english version you and i talked about a little bit well uh, t- tell me your thoughts on the english version of the song so my main thing is <clears throat> so in the gap between the main, the full main version of, I guess, version two of the song and the first version, I found an English cover of just the intro TV sized, whatever. Yeah. And it's kind of funny to hear it in English where the words make sense. So from that cover to hearing it to like the band singing it themselves in English, it just doesn't feel like the right song to me. Like even yeah. though I know I know it's literally the, literally the same exact song, I know it's a language I can understand versus trying to understand Japanese, but it's basically the same vibe to me as when I play Yakuza games, and it's not a Yakuza game to me unless it's in Japanese with subtitles. Like <laughs> yeah, like no. the new Like a Dragon game defaulted to English and just English speaking, and it it felt dirty and gross and wrong. Yeah, that's not a, I, that's that's not how it should be. Yeah, so I got all excited when I switched it in the game, and it's the same vibe where, like, yes, if I want to sing along to one of the songs and learn the words, obviously I can hopefully pronounce, uh, pronounce. I can't say pronounce <laughs> right. I, I can't pronounce pronounce. Uh, I can hopefully pronounce the actual English lyrics and sing along, but it just wouldn't feel like I'm singing the actual song. Then. It feels like I'm singing a cover of the song. Yeah, that's that's my vibe, too. Like, we've we've heard at least the first half. We Actually, you know, since they changed it up, we've heard... The first two verses now, really. Um, so we've heard the majority of this song so much now that, yeah, the English version feels like so weird. It just feels like a cover. It feels like they're um, it feels like someone is like doesn't know the words to the song that I know really well. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I find like I find I don't need English versions of these songs, really, because like you end up hearing them so much like I find that I can like memorize and sing along to like the sounds of the Japanese words. Like, like I don't know what I'm saying, but I, I know what the words are, um, which yeah, is pretty much like all the J rock, J metal, Kawhi metal, whatever that we're going to consider all like the, the screamy Japanese bands. Like when I sing in the car along with the music, I'm basically just trying to make the sounds of the words. Cause yeah, I know yeah. I don't know the words. I'm like totally, yeah. That's and that's exactly what I do as well. Yeah, it's like just 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 emulating the sounds that you're hearing, um, but it's it's still fun. Still feels like singing along. Uh, Shade says the English version has its moments. Dot dot dot. Some lyrics in the song are pretty cool, but it does have that translated song vibe. LOL. And I think that is the perfect description. Um, <laughs> I think even if I hadn't heard the original and I heard the English, I would suspect that it was translated because it like. There, there's some stuff that's really awkward. There's some stuff that doesn't quite fit in the space that they're fitting it in. Like it, it definitely feels like they came back later and tried to try to make stuff work. Uh, Shade says, I did some re- more research online and it feel, and it seems like the English version was translated from the Chinese version, according to people who uh, have more knowledge about the language than me. So that's, that's interesting that, that yeah, it goes. I wa- yeah. <laughs> it I wonder went, why. 
I don't know. Like it must have just been that that was maybe the cadence was a little bit easier to line up and the the words were a little bit easier, but it must have been like it must be people who are breaking down that telephone game of like, well, <coughs> well, from Japanese to Chinese, you would translate it this way and then from Chinese to English, you would often translate it this way where you wouldn't have if you went straight from Japanese. Like there must be some like quirks of the language that are obvious when you do that, but that's that's kind of fascinating. Yeah, that's really the only thing I can think of. Like that would be yeah. it. I would watch a long YouTube video of someone breaking down the intricate details of why that <laughs> that was the case. That because that sounds very very interesting. Shade says on the topic of official English uh, OPs, you would be surprised at the amount of them that exist, especially when you consider that not a lot of people recognize that there is even an English demographic for these shows at the time the songs were made. <coughs> Excuse me. Some of my favorite are the themes for Time Ranger, Ginga Man, and my personal favorite, Bookenger's ending theme, Adventure on the Road. Um, yeah, it is weird, because, like, the, uh, you know, bringing Common Rider and bringing Sentai shows to the West is a relatively new thing. I know we've done it a little bit in the past, and, like, you know, Hawaii got some translated shows and stuff, like, way back in the day. But for the most part, it's a relatively modern occurrence that uh, we can legally watch any of this stuff. And still it's such a tiny amount of it <laughs> that, that we've gotten <laughs> in like official DVD releases and in like official streaming services and stuff. So it's weird that they've spent the time multiple times over <laughs> throughout the history of Sentai and Kamen Rider to make English versions of the songs. But you know, it, I, I wonder if it's like, I, I would say, Japanese media in general often uses way more English than you would expect. Like you probably know this from like playing video games of just like you can go, especially like retro games, you can go back through like the history of Japanese games and find a lot of them that are just fully in English already. <laughs> What's well, um, one of those things too, where like, I just assume the rest of the world is smarter than us and everyone that too <laughs> bilinguals most things and doesn't just like, I know English. That's it. Look at me. Cause it's even crazy to me where again with the, with the, the J music in general, it, it's always kind of funny to me that most songs will be like Japanese verses and then a shitload of English in the chorus or yeah. like they'll jump back and forth between Japanese and English. And I, so obviously enough people in Japan know English that they can go back and forth and everyone gets the songs and I get like 10% of the songs. That's the only part I know. And, I just assume everyone's smarter than us and they enjoy going back and forth between languages. <laughs> totally. Um, there's a, so I think we've talked about on this podcast before that I am into Beyblade X right now, and I've been watching the Beyblade X anime, uh, which is, which is pretty good. But the best thing about the Beyblade X anime is the opening song. Uh, it's incredibly good. <laughs> so it is by a band called one. Okay. Rock. And no, it's called, fuck you. It's called Prove. Do you know them? Yeah. Okay, I, I, great. Oh. <laughs> well, I mean, I, you, yes, I'm sure you've known them much longer than me. I, I learned about them. No, because no I don't like them. I don't like them. Oh. This is the, they're, they are the Kuga of the, the J Rockerverse. Okay. I don't know really anything else about them, but this one song is very good. But when I looked them up, um, they do entire albums. Like they'll do an album in Japanese and then that same album in English. So like the, the song for Beyblade X they have an English version of it as well. They have a Monster Hunter song where they actually have like CG monsters in the video with them. That looks amazing. Uh, they are signed to Fueled by Ramen Records here. And they have oh, albums yeah, from yeah. here. They <laughs> toured with All Time Low, Yellow Card, a shitload of like American bands. That's like I funny. actually, I actually think they're up there in like one of the most well known bands that are out there like rock bands at least like they get everywhere kind of thing well now they're in in beyblade so you know they're hitting hitting me where they didn't before i guess <laughs> i don't know um them being on fueled by ramen is incredible <laughs> by the way, <laughs> that's so funny um but uh yes yeah, so that's another example though of like english being not even a secondary language for like a, a, a band that, that doesn't speak english as their first language it's just like it's just like, no, we just do both. We just like completely equally make both versions of the song. That's a uh, kind of wild to think about. Can you imagine like 
an American band being like, yeah, we're just going to put out a Japanese album too, like a Japanese language album. At uh, best. I know there's like two or three. I'm going to, I I think they're at least Spanish vibe bands. Like El Nino was one. Uh, there's one or two other ones where they have full albums that are half the songs in Spanish. I want to say it was and they're half are in English. So that would be the closest we have here. And your last two music facts, because this episode is all over the goddamn place. <laughs> <laughs> so the only cool thing One OK Rock did that we that I watched live was during COVID, they rented out an entire baseball stadium and they played a live concert to nobody in a baseball stadium and filmed it. Uh, that's cool. I like that. And the reason I know them is because I don't know the singer's name offhand. I'd have to think about it real quick. But his brother, Hero, sings in the band My First Story. And My First Story is one of my favorite J-Rock bands. So Hero is the one that I even called Sabi in Gotchard. Because when Hero talks, he talks like this real quiet and mumbles. And then when he sings, he like belts it out as high as possible. And he's fantastic. But it's crazy <laughs> that My First Story is like a pure Tobescore kind of band. So I gave one OK Rock a chance because I was like, oh, it's Hero's brother. It should be good. And they're very like soft boy bandy rock. and I don't like them, which is why <laughs> my first reaction was, oh, fuck you. And not I know who they are. <laughs> OK, that's fair. Yeah. So the, the, the prove song that is the Beyblade intro, it definitely has some softer elements, but then it, like it comes in kind of hard and like hits really good. Yeah, that's what they do. Um, it's a freaking toss up. And then the live show was weak <laughs> and now I'm against them and. The whole thing it's like Kuga. again it's the i might, Kuga I might the not verse. like the rest of the i might not like the rest of their stuff but yeah this, this one is good like if you if i give you like 30 seconds of, of this one song you would understand why i'm into it <laughs> okay but, um do you know the band the casualties yes okay so they did early early on um i just looked it up their their album on the front line they then recorded a spanish language version called en la linea del frente <laughs> <laughs> which is one of the only bands i could think of that uh did that from like starting in english and then going to a different language my yeah. last one real quick then is the band alistair which was like a chicago united states pop punk band yep they kind of they kind of like shot their shot their wad a little bit before their time. Like they were primed to be huge and just kind of disappeared. They moved to Japan and they have EPs that are half actual Japanese songs and half English songs. And their Japanese is pretty good. That's awesome. I didn't know that about them. That's very fun. Okay. Music time's over. I'm going to be the, I'm going to do the adult thing and swear (laughs) of this. (laughs) All right. All right. Fair enough. (laughs) Uh, And that's going to do it for emails. Uh, Once again, thanks. (laughs) Look uh, what you all did. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> thanks to dave thanks to shade for sending in the emails this week uh if you want to send in an email next time send those over to cast at common writer uh all right let's jump in and let's talk about the common writer episode this week we watched gotchard episode 21 this was as we predicted the culmination of the kind of spanner valverad <laughs> what's that I said the spanner arc. The spanner arc, exactly. So this was really the thing that that gave us common writer Valverad. That was the big ending here. Was that uh, Spanner became a common writer finally? Um, but I think you know these two episodes have been so incredibly good. Um, there's there's like brutal stuff in it. The whole stuff with the parents. Like this episode opens with the angel Malgum saying that he's just going to bring the parents back and kill them in front of Spanner over and over again. <laughs> until, until, <laughs> he, until he lets the darkness out. He's just going to keep murdering his parents in front of him as many times as possible. It is the most baller, insane thing. That is, that is yeah, that's just um, incredibly dark. <laughs> and, I, and I really, really like it. <laughs> um, and yeah, you know, it really is a pickup from 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 last last week around where everyone is just really trying to get the darkness sucked out of Spanner. <laughs> um, so let's let's not, I guess, beat around the bush here. Um, what do you let's think? Get podcasting. Let's get podcasting. What do you think about Common Rider Valverad, the the look of the suit that we get at the end here? So the his main suit looks cool it's a 
like it, it's almost like a half upgrade of what his old suit was, at least as far as I could tell from the quick cuts. Uh, it looks a little more, I guess, car like or like machine like or whatever vibe he's supposed to be. Yeah. Uh, the new helmet's sick. The having the two different colored eyes to like represent like, I guess, probably like controlling the evil still. He has the purple eye and the clear eye or the lenses. Uh, the purple eye glowing when he starts like hawking out and being badass is cool. Uh, one of the favorite silly things is there's a giant bolt that like, gets screwed into his head to put the helmet on him. Yeah. And that, that was pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, that is fun. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that the the suit looks very like the the cool thing about Valverad before, and it you know, was actually true in the lore too. Like, this is kind of handmade, right? Like he wasn't a common writer, but he like built himself this power armor essentially. So a lot of it looked kind of rusty and looked kind of handmade and stuff. That's what they were going for. Uh, and this basically looks like the souped up hot rod, like mass produced version. Like now it's kind of shiny and chrome where it was rusty before. And it's just like a little bit more powerful. You know, all that stuff is very, very cool. Uh, so yeah, I think it looks great. I like, I like the, you know, big, huge uh, uh, bolt that gets screwed into his head. That's that's super, super cool. It makes... Um, when he's fighting, makes really awesome like shifting noises and animation, which oh, yeah, people he, he really shifted, liked. He, he shifted through all five gears of himself, I guess. Yep. We'll call it. <laughs> <laughs> and then that ended with him like um, rider kicking a, his sword through the enemy, like straight through their their chest, <laughs> which is again brutal and badass. Um, yeah, and, so, yeah, and he gets it, and he gets all the best catchphrases now oh, that yeah. he's. I guess uh, absorbed the evil, dealt with the evil, purged the evil, whatever vibe we're supposed to take away from this whole thing. Uh, like his one, one of his last ones was like, I'm going to put you in hell or like, I'm the one that's going to send you to hell or something <laughs> yeah, like that. I'm, like, I'm here to send you to hell. I'm the one that's going to send you to hell. Yeah. <laughs> so all, it was that. And then there was um, his speech into his transformation into the cool guy. I like I said I got chills. Josh was like, "This is the best goddamn monologue ever." Yeah, I, it, it was. Um, I'll try to hunt for it here while we're talking, so I get the uh, get the wording right. But the, yeah, it was like um, it was the best like hero's thesis I think in a show that I've ever heard. Where basically he's like, "I'm going to take the flames that imbued within me uh, to to fight the demons." Like it was so good. Like it was amazing. <laughs> it was like. It was everything you want from a like shojin hero. Like, you know, it, like I just want him to like overcome all odds and 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 build this fire within and have the fighting spirit uh, <laughs> to to beat all all comers and that's exactly what he what he embodied. That's exactly what he said. It was it was so good. <laughs> um yeah, I uh I, they I liked Spanner before this. You know, you know, we we like to meme on Spanner a little bit with how much he'd been losing battles and stuff like that. But he was a, he was a good character. I liked, I liked kind of what they'd been doing with him. And especially as they were building him out and you found out his parents had died and you found out that this professor had kind of taken him in. They were, they were kind of building up sort of what, um, what he was as a character and kind of what was going on with him. Now that he is this brooding good guy, almost like Punisher-esque, right? Where he like, He's got a chip on his shoulder, but he's a good guy. <laughs> um, he is so badass. One of the coolest <laughs> Kamen Rider characters I think I've ever seen. This whole episode, when you and I watched it together, was just us going like, oh my god, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> his, uh, uh, his line that got Josh and I both super hyped before he went full badass Kamen Rider was, I use the flames imbued within me. Uh to incinerate demons who dare steal the futures of others. That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't I can't hear that without just like giggling with happiness. <laughs> and then he infused his dead parents into his ring and then went full badass. <laughs> yeah. I guess that's maybe like my only slight complaint with this episode is that nothing really changed for him. Like in in the first episode, he was super angry. And became amalgam because of it. And this time around, like at the end, he's still pretty angry. 
he just is a good guy now. Like <laughs> it, it's weird that they like him getting pestered about his parents dying. Um, he was able to forge that into a positive energy. Like they didn't, in, in my opinion, they didn't really hammer home why he, why that change was able to happen. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think they did good enough. Like, cause the basically, I guess we're going to jump around with how this episode played out, but that's fine. Yeah, I think it's fine. So like one of the times or the time right in the beginning where like his parents were going to get murdered again, both of his parents were like, you can't re-kill us if we just take ourselves out. And his parents killed themselves, so he got their rings. And then the angel thing couldn't bring him back anymore. And most of the ex- episode was him having like flashbacks to the Nothing Realm. We would just kind of like relive his past over and over. And eventually he realized that his parents died to sacrifice him. But they're like, we love you. We know you'll be a fantastic person. Yeah. So he finally, got, he finally got to see that. And then seconds after we saw his fake mom doing the brain wipe to be like, I don't know how to help you. I'm sorry. I love you too. And he, I guess he, that was his acceptance of my parents loved me. They, they died for me. My new mom loves me. She did everything she could for me up to this point. That's true. That's true. But the one thing we did say that we pointed out was when they backstoried him and fake mom the first time, she said, you had such bad nightmares that I didn't know what to do with you eventually. So I wiped your brain. She wouldn't remember the death of your parents. So that was the lore they established two episodes ago, I think it was. And in this episode, they showed her brain wiping him 10 seconds after his parents died. Yeah. And so he remembered literally nothing, which is still fine. But they completely changed the arc that they presented like two weeks ago. Yeah, that was interesting. I wonder if they just decided that it works it, better this way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, like just from a narrative perspective, it makes a lot more sense doing it then. Um, and then he can remember both things at once. I think that makes a lot more sense rather than just as it was presented before. I'm just like, would you go the F to sleep? Mind wipe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, you're, you're, you're totally right. I guess they had like the, him, him regaining the memory of his parents and the speech that they gave him that we didn't know about until this episode kind of as they were dying was the like catalyst for I'm, I'm using my dark energy to as, as good. now. You're, you're right. I, I kind of have forgotten a lot about that little part of that scene. Riku also uses dark energy for good. Just for the record. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to stop doing it. I refuse to stop doing it. I am not going to stop doing it. <laughs> the funny thing is every time you do it to like, I don't, I don't know enough about kingdom hearts that there's like half a second where I have to do the translation in my head of like, who is he talking about? Oh, sh- it's King you, of Hearts. You know who I'm always talking about. Come on. I do. Yeah. That's why it's only a half second translation. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I, that, uh, yeah, that, that, that's, that's all very cool. And then of course the, the, the person and the fight that led Spanner to kind of have the big transformation moment was. So, I, so yeah. I guess I'll do, I guess we'll do it this way. The A storyline of this uh-huh. episode was Spanner becoming common Rider of Alvarad. The B storyline of this episode <laughs> is yeah, kind the- of like the things that went around those moments. So Indeed. now we now, now we can do those other little scenes that mixed in between everything else. Yeah, I think which kind of opens with a uh I guess talk of descent from the Abyssal Sisters. <laughs> Would you say that's the first, the first thing in the in the B plot? Yeah, um, where the where... two old the two older sisters again are like talking to the two the little ones, saying like, "Listen, they're gonna try to make Spanner evil, and when they make Spanner evil, they're just gonna get rid of all three of us." Like you know, you think that Goldman loves you and he's taking care of you, but he's just gonna get rid of all of us. And then one of the sisters gets blasted across the room again for her insolence. Yep. The other one this time. So not <laughs> so so both of the older sisters have been blown all the way across the room. Um the I I think I think that you're totally right. I think that this is indicating that the two older sisters are eventually going to uh leave the fold <laughs> and 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 rebel against Garion and the the bad forces. But I think the little sister is maybe in it for the long haul because she's the one who does the throwing across the room this time. <laughs> um, but the the one sister, the one who gets thrown across the room, 
literally says the words like, well, if we all turn traitor together, <laughs> so she's, she's fully talking about, um, we should, we should all just leave. Like we should get out of here and not be a part of this anymore. And even as with part of that, at one point, like all the kids are fighting together, like the Gotchard kids and the baby sister kids or baby metal kids. And the sister that got beat up in the beginning literally just walked away during the fight. Like she was kind of in the background ish while everyone else was fighting. And she literally just turned her back and walked away. <laughs> yeah, she she um she, she she goes to watch over uh the interaction between between Minato and Spanner, but yeah, she just leaves the fight, isn't clearly isn't isn't in it for her. Um doesn't really care about the outcome that much. Um so it, interesting. I, you know, we we'd seen her give some looks for a couple episodes and now she actually like voices her concern which is kind of what you'd expect that she she feared that they would get kind of tossed aside and you know i think gary has shown that that's what he does with people he's got a whole uh collection of of uh of like <laughs> weird mummy people that he, <laughs> he he used to clearly care more about than he does now uh and overhearing that talk of dissent was none other than professor Minato. he was kind of hanging out outside and the one abyssal sister uh realizes this and says like oh so you were like listening to all of that <laughs> <laughs> and he basically promises her that um that spanner won't become her the the lapdog of garion because monato is going to take him out first um uh, which yeah then then monato kind of gets set off on a little journey in this episode first he goes and he visits uh, the professor Kyoka, uh, so Spanner's kind of surrogate mom. <laughs> and in one of the cooler kind of like lines in the episode, you know, in an episode filled with cool lines, she's like, are you here to take the driver or kill me? And he's like, both. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but turns out he doesn't actually kill her. <laughs> Spoiler alert. She, she, she does. Okay. But uh, what he, he takes the driver from her and then he goes and he confronts Spanner. And then what, what happens while he's um, while he's confronting Spanner? So basically, this is when Spanner becomes common rider of Alvarad. But he kind of like he turns into dread, beats the shit out of him. And he kind of like reverse motivates him to use the power of his parents, I guess we'll call it to like. Yeah, I would say he goads him. Yeah, yeah. So he kind of like goads him, to use Josh's fancy word, into becoming common rider Valverad. And we eventually, through all these little moments, realize that for the past month, two months, six weeks, how long it's been, uh, Monado was probably never actually evil. He was just playing stupid, we believe, to get Spanner to this moment where he could motivate him to become the hero he should be and not be just Valverad himself. Yeah, I mean, it seems it seemed very intentional because he. So, yeah, he he not only. um, <coughs> You know, he he's antagonizing Spanner about kind of everything, but one of the things that he does is he tells Spanner that he killed the Professor Kyoka. And then he he taunts Spanner about about her apparent death, basically like, oh, she wasted the last 10 years of her life on you. Um, you know, y- really, if you think about it, you're the one who killed her and on and on. Um, and then, yes, eventually that that drives Spanner to, you know, unlock his true potential and Spanner in a very, very awesome fight scene almost murders Minato in the <laughs> dread armor, like hits him so hard. He shatters the dread armor from around Minato and, and hurts Minato pretty bad. Hurts him to the point where at the end. Uh, when they double check on Minato, he was like, like bloody and beat up whatever. And he's like. Wow, he at least missed my vitals. <laughs> yeah, he missed my vitals. Is is an awesome line again. <laughs> uh, but as, as you said, we find out at the end. So obviously, he didn't actually kill Professor Kyoko. We we didn't see the end of that scene, but she's alive at the end. Spanner shows up to go talk to her again, um, kind of to make up, uh, which is a a very touching little scene between the two of them. She puts his arm, her arm around him, and he, you know. Clearly is still kind of troubled, but like he's he's accepting himself back kind of into the fold and all that stuff. Uh, but in that scene, he says, um, basically, he almost deceived me 
uh and and she's like uh oh so so i guess i guess he's still alive or something like she so basically like the the wording of that scene indicates that like minato was trying to fool you to to draw your potential out and uh he left me al- alive and i knew that he was going to do this essentially <coughs> so there's still questions there about you know is that the only reason that minato is playing along with this whole thing <laughs> D- does he have more things going on, more reasons to be there. Is he actually evil, but he just cared about Spanner? Um, who knows on these things? Um, but the, at least that one, he w- he tried to insert himself and and make it so Spanner didn't turn evil, but instead unlocked this kind of like full potential, basically. And when Spanner unlocked his potential, uh, three or four of his Pokemon evolved. Uh, Mad Wheel <laughs> became Mach Wheel. Uh, the bulldozer went up a level, and I think there was one more where he was like, "Wow, like you guys all evolved to or whatever word they use for it." They don't call them evolutions, but something close to that. I, he um he said something along the lines of like, "Oh, you uh you you heard it might not, it might have been exactly this or it's a similar vibe like you you heard the reverberations of my heart kind of a thing like <laughs> oh you're like picking up what I'm putting putting down too okay great let's do it." Uh, be, but the one like like was a literal, a literal Pokemon evolution, <laughs> where where Mad Wheel became Mock Wheel, which is a great great one. Yeah, like, mentioned like, in the email section. Yeah, yeah, like the card does like the the bounce or like the shake of like, hey, what's what's Mad Wheel doing? And then just like <laughs> the car drives away and comes back and goes Mock Wheel. Like, oh shit, it got better. He was so excited about about the new common Rider. He's like, I'm gonna put on some new clothes. It's great. <laughs> and and Mockwheel does fit more with Valverad, the common writer Valverad, because again, it's like the souped up version. <laughs> so it's like a little bit fancier, a little bit sleeker when it works out, works out good. Yeah, like the whole but like <laughs> obviously if you're listening to this, you watch the tale. Like the whole vibe, this entire episode of Spanner's descent into madness slash ascent into super badass armored common rider for real is just like the craziest happiest most exciting vibe like this whole yeah. like josh said a bunch of times like it's just the, one of the such a solid goddamn episode all around <laughs> yeah i can't even fully i don't feel like i'm even explaining it yeah again everyone watched this so i don't need to explain it but like- said, that's, that's what's good about this we're, <laughs> I, I, we're, we're getting into the territory now where i feel like we're we're doing uh, disjustice or injustice yeah. to the situation. So, <laughs> yeah, because I can only say it was cool so many times, but like that's, yeah, it was just a vibe. Like the whole, um, th- they did such a great job of capturing the like tortured hero rise that, that he does here. Um, and all the fights are so well done and the visuals look so cool. The flaming sword that he has during a good chunk of the fight um, w- before he becomes, um, becomes the true valverad is so cool um i think at one point even like is using an actual sword that's actually on fire like most yeah, like, of the cg guess, yeah. but i think there's one scene in there where it's real fire um yeah definitely <laughs> I, I i saw uh people um i think people on twitter i think have seen, have over the last couple of weeks been definitely turning on gotcha and were like oh this is like really good now and I saw someone tweet, I think, I think it was like today that was like, oh, I I've like, I'm genuinely like super hype <laughs> on Gotcha <laughs> now. Uh, and it was after this episode had, had come out. So that, uh, that makes sense to me too. <laughs> I just, 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 if you think back to where this show started, they have, uh, really corrected the ship, <laughs> everything, um, <laughs> uh, that was, that was not everyone's cup of tea, I think has, um, has been fixed. And now, thinking back comparing this to like geats or something like i think it is right on the same level and maybe even now has passed it for me in, in some aspects like spanner i think is cooler than any of the characters from the last uh from the last show which is crazy to say i, I wouldn't have said that two weeks ago <laughs> about <laughs> about anything spanner gets his first win in like three and a half months and everyone just loves him now he needed it <laughs> the, the the slump is over all right uh well yeah we'll we'll stop we'll stop gushing about the episode there then. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah uh that that will do it for us for this week 
as always, as, as I mentioned, um, if you want to send us in an email, cast at commonwritersucks.com. And we also have a Patreon. Um, we would love for you to check that out. For just three bucks a month, you get access to a bunch of bonus content that we put out uh, every single week. We do what we call Watch and Reacts, where we watch uh, Tokusatsu, we watch Common Rider, and you get to watch along with us. You hear our thoughts as you're watching the show. Uh, they're super, super fun to do, kind of like Mystery Science Theater. And uh, currently, we are, we are watching through Common Rider X Aid. And um, we, ha- as of late, have been also watching Gotchard episodes together there, too. So if you want to hear our thoughts in real time as we watch the episode, uh, that is the place to find that. So patreon.com slash the comment writers. Again, three bucks a month, and you get access to our Discord community, which is uh, an ever growing community of Toku fans and uh, just an all around great group of people that are fun to hang out with all week long. All week long. 24 all... 7, 3, 6, <laughs> 5, 5. Indeed. And we have people, yeah, since, since we, we have people, you know, in different countries and kind of around the world, it really is 24 7 because I. Sometimes I'm up late saying things in there and then I'm waking up at like six in the morning and responding to things that people have said overnight. So sometimes that's, my, that's fun. My sleep schedule is completely fucked for some reason where I wake up at like three o'clock in the morning. And if I go in the greatest discord ever, our discord, just to clarify, there are people for me for three o'clock in the morning. There's people Ray chatting in there. I just go in. And I'm like, well, I can I can bug so and so. And you won't know who so and so is until you join and find out. <laughs> they're they're gonna be so surprised when we actually have someone named so and so in there it's wild someone yeah. join and make your name so and so and then you'll be the person i was talking about instead and it'll be like a cool little meta thing whoa that's crazy <laughs> so link down in the description for all of that information uh but go check it out and uh yeah that's gonna wrap it up for us for this week so toby where can the people find you on the internet on Twitter, it's at Life of Tobes, and on YouTube, it's Tobes Plays, where we are currently playing all the Resident Evil games, and right now, we just started Resident Evil 4 Remake. Yeah, that's that's very exciting. It was It is very exciting. Yeah. I, I yell and shoot zombies. <laughs> uh, for me, of course, the YouTube channel channel is Pretty Dece. Search for that, youtube.com slash Pretty Dece. Um, most places on the internet, I am at Pretty Dece Josh, so that would be twitter and and threads and and that stuff uh on blue sky which i'm using a little bit more often i am at meek.lol um and i also use tumblr on occasion which is pretty decent josh as well so check me out on those places um and yeah that's gonna do it for us we'll be back next time around uh to talk about i'm I'm getting there i'm getting there i'm getting there i'm getting there (laughs) okay (laughs) uh that's why i said next time around and not next week around because uh, I will be out of town for a couple weeks. So we Josh is going on special assignment. I'm going on special assignment. Exactly. Uh, going on a little vacation. So Toby and I will not be able to record for a little while. Uh, so probably the next time that Toby and I record, we will be talking about maybe a double episode of Gotchard. So we'll probably be talking about what 22 and 23 at the same time. That's at least the current plan. Um, so look for another episode from us. Um, another new episode from us probably in two weeks so we'll take take a little bit of time off there um we might post something to the to the podcast uh feed in the meantime maybe we'll we'll um maybe we'll find an old episode or a ramble cast or something to post we'll see uh but uh new stuff talking about new episodes of gotchard will be a little bit of a break before before coming back but no one be upset no one be worried we are no gonna one let back. the evil no one let the evil rise up and turn into a dark a dark common rider there's no yeah. reason for that, you know. Just think about the happy stuff, the good memories. Maybe you, maybe your brain got wiped too, and you feel like better. You feel you feel good. <laughs> and if anyone is really upset about it, you can join the Patreon because we will have stuff going up on the Patreon for this time. Even though there aren't going to be uh, episodes um, talking about the new Gotchard, you can join the Patreon and check out some X Aid watch and reacts, uh, so you can you can get your Toby and Josh fix if you really need us that badly. (laughs) Uh, So yeah, that's going to do it for us. We'll be back to talk about those Gotcha episodes. I'm sure there will be tons to talk about by the time we get back together. Uh, But until then, have a great couple of weeks, everyone. Peace.